You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 174, live from Lubbock, Texas. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's a scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike. Welcome to my college hometown. Yeah, yeah, you've told me about that a dozen times. Yeah, so. the home of champions, just like uh, <laughs> like yeah, I am, huh? Of, of course. Of no, course. but we want to give a quick uh, thank you to Nathan for organizing this event yep. and for Wayland Baptist University for Absolutely. hosting the event. We yep. appreciate it. And uh, we're back doing another live Q&A, so um, we're ready for y'all's questions, if y'all are. Yep, so how are we going to do this? What's the procedure? Whoever wants to ask a question, raise your hand and okay, Nathan will the mic. All bring right. you the mic. I'm Clint and I'm from uh, Malakoff, Texas. In Revelation 12, does the reference to one third of the stars falling to earth indicate that at that time those angels had enough understanding of the Messiah's purpose and attributes to decide they didn't like God's plan and so they rebelled at that time? Yeah, so that that question, I, I don't need to repeat the question, I presume. I think we got everybody on the mic here. Um, the question in part depends on whether you think the angels were that are referred to were good guys, because you, you prefaced it by saying they rebelled, or whether they are, you know, bad guys already. And in other words, what, what's their state? So if you, if you let's just read through it a little bit. It said, another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Now, the way you worded your question, did the did a third of the angels know enough about the Messiah is the way I think you put it, so that they would rebel? Is that is that how you, you frame the question? Kind of like you say that the, the gospel was, was hidden, had to be revealed. Mm -hmm. And if the rulers had known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Mm -hmm. That kind of track. Yeah, I... I don't know if, if we can really read this as a rebellion. You could read it as an attack by the dragon on, you know, good guy, good guy angels, if we want to put it that way. And so a third of them are defeated or cast to earth. Um, it's conceivable to me that, that you could read it that way. Th that question is in part led or related to what comes later. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back. Are we to assume in verse 7 that the dragon and his angels, the his angels there are the same that were swept down in verse 4? And the way you word the question, you, you know, it assumes that. I don't actually read it that way. I don't, I don't think that we have to read one particular group between verses 4 and 7. And so we don't have to read angels in rebellion in verse 4. It could be the terminology of conflict where you have God's, God's servants, God's side suffering, you know, in the conflict, suffering a defeat of some sort. So that, that's the way I, I tend to read it. So that, that's a long way of saying, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that direction with it. But, but you could, uh, if you did, you know, and say that, this was sort of a seduction of a third of the angels. The swept down is really a language for uh, a third of the angels were convinced, okay, to join the, the side of the dragon. I think it's reading a lot into the passage to sort of fill that gap. You know, well, what convinced them? Well, it was, you know, it was this Messiah about to be born. Well, why would that have bothered them? I mean, again, you can read it that way, but it, it, it seems, again, for my taste, it requires a little bit too much front loading of of that kind of information to read the passage that way but if if you you know if you have answers that satisfy yourself uh, as far as you know answering those questions again you, you wouldn't be alone reading it that way i just i don't and i don't think you have to somebody else robert from hobbs new mexico in genesis 3 uh, verse 14 where it reads, the, uh, so the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. 
in reference to verse 19, where he's telling Adam now, in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground for you, for for out of it you were taken for dust you are and to dust you shall return. Do those two words for the dust that the serpent's going to eat and the dust that men's going to turn into, is that the same word? Is there any correlation between those two words? Well, we can we can look it up right here. So the one verse was verse 14. Okay, right here's dust. That's afar in Hebrew. And then down to verse 19, same word. So yes, they're the same word. Is And is there something you want to build on that? I guess the second part of that is that is the serpent... I mean, are we going to be ingested by that, by this entity being when we return to dust? That if our corporal bodies are going to be there. Yeah, I. If you remember, um, have you read Unseen Realm? I don't. Okay, in in Unseen Realm, I, I talk a little bit about this particular passage. I take the language here since since I don't take the Nakash, the serpent, as being only a member of the animal kingdom. I take the Nakash as being a divine being in rebellion. And again, depending on how you take the term, it could be a divine being that, you know, manifests itself in this way. Again, this is very common. Uh, guys like Walton and others have, have discussed at length that you can have, uh, it, it's common in ancient Near Eastern literature to have divine communication uh, happen through animals. And everybody knows that, that, well, animals don't really talk. If we run into a talking snake, like in the, um, in the tale of Sinua in, in, in Egypt, everybody knows that's a divine being because snakes don't normally talk. So I, I think, you know, there, there's certainly a lot to be said for that here. In Unseen Realm, I talk about Nakash being, if it's a noun, it's, it's actually Hanakash. So it's the word plus the definite article. If it's a noun, then you can legitimately translate it as serpent. If it's a participle, if it's a verb from the same ver verb of the same root, then it would mean the one who dispenses divine information, the one who you know, gives divinatory knowledge. And that's certainly in play here, too. If it's an adjective that's substantivized through the article, then it means the shining one, which is a stock description for a divine being. So in Unseen Realm, I talk about all three of those. And I think that the readers are, are really led to think all three of those things, not just one. So since I take it as a divine being uh, having a conversation in Eden, Eden is, the, is the, the divine abode, the cosmic mountain, the abode of the divine council in ancient Near Eastern thinking. Uh, gardens and mountains, Eden is referred to both ways in the Old Testament. Since I look at the passage that way, I take what is said in the, the judgment terms to this quote-unquote animal, to the serpent. I take uh, metaphorically because of what's done to the serpent. The serpent is cast down to Eretz. Okay, to the ground. Yeah, it's ground, but Eretz is also the word, the one word that gets, that can mean Sheol. There's reference in Isaiah 14. There's, you know, the passage in Jonah that clearly uses the term for Sheol. So I think the point of the cursing language is that you want it to be above the most high, Isaiah 14, but you're now, now I'm going to put you below or put you underneath all of the animals of the earth. In other words, you're going to be down in, in the realm of the dead, the underworld. So I take the curse as metaphorical. And since I do that for the serpent, I don't think we have a literal kind of, we die and we return to the dust and then the serpent eats us kind of thing, you know, kind of a literalism going on. So I would tend to not read it that way for those reasons. Mm -hmm. My name is Nathan. I, uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, this is Nathan, the organizer. My name's Nathan. I'm here in Lubbock, and uh, I was curious, and uh, I've actually got two questions, if you don't mind. Um, in San Antonio live Q&A with David Burnett, uh, you had mentioned an article coming out about uh, Romans 1 and how it all ties into Genesis 3 and Genesis 6 and Genesis 11, and how Paul is kind of weaving all three threads into that short little deal of Romans 1. And... Uh, but you said you were skeptical, um, but I was just curious if you had had a chance to read it and what your he, thoughts on it were. He, he has not produced the article itself yet. This is not Burnett. This is the person Burnett yes, and I yeah, were talking yeah, yeah. to. Um, that was a conference paper, which uh, we talked to him afterwards. And, you know, he, he didn't want to give me the article then because he thought, I mean, he didn't use these terms, but 
typically when, when grad students don't want to give you their conference papers, it's because they think it's still half-baked. And they, they often read papers at SBL to get feedback, like, okay, what am I missing here? Am I going off in la-la land? Somebody tell me, uh, that kind of thing. So he didn't want to, want to give me the paper. Uh, he said he was going to keep working on it and possibly submit it for publication, but he has not done that, so I, I haven't read it. Roger that. Mm-hmm. And uh, my second question was, uh, you remember back in March or April, you had uh, you had your your guys on Faith Life uh, defending you and the book from Heresy when Lexham released it for two weeks on a forty five day <laughs> reading plan. Uh, are, you, are you talking about the, uh, the the forum? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. And I don't. So, I can't claim to to know or recall who those guys were, but yeah, I I know there were people jumping in there. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> On, on one of the one of the threads, someone uh, there was a missionary got uh, talking about how in the ancient original Chinese, uh, the, the the character for righteousness is a man with a lamb over his shoulders and a tree, and the the word for for prohibit is two trees in a garden, and things of that nature, and that got tied into a conversation of Acts seventeen, mm-hmm. and I was just curious, um, how do we parse? The disinheritance of Babel in Acts 17 with First uh, Timothy 4.10, which says, For this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Mm-hmm. So what do, we, what do we do with that? Yeah, I, let's go back to the, the, the Chinese thing. I, I don't know Chinese, so I can't really evaluate that. I, I can tell you what I would want to see to think that there's any significance between the biblical story and the Chinese character. I I don't think generally that we would, and I'm not saying the source would say this either, um, that, that a claim like, Oh, the Chinese language, you know, the character based language is based on Christian theology or, or the Bible or anything like that. So let's wipe that off the table. What I would want to know is, was this character introduced in a post-Christian era? Because, you know, Chinese has lots of characters. Um, if if the character was introduced well before the Christian era, well, then I would say that you don't have a Christian connection. If it was introduced afterwards, well, then maybe, you know, maybe there there's something to that. I don't know. Um, I don't know either the historical question uh, to be able to answer that or in, in Chinese in terms of characters, though. But that I'm just telling you, that's what I would want to know, just right off the bat. Um, does that have anything to do with, you know, the, this again coming from the Deuteronomy 32 worldview? How do we parse something like that? On the one hand, if if it if the character is post-Christian, well, then that sort of answers that question. It, there might have been some Christian influence there, and then somebody could have invented a character to convey a specific concept based upon something, maybe a missionary taught, who knows Um, that, that that's one trajectory. I don't think since we don't have a clear picture of what you described in the character, even in the old Testament, I doubt that the Chinese people got a clearer picture than the Israelites did. So I don't, I don't think we can really track fruitfully on that trajectory. If you're, if the question is about, um, how does how how were the nations you know saved? How were they made acceptable to God? Uh, that sort of thing. I my my sort of paradigm for this is that God. This is ultimately for God to decide. God provides information to whomever He will. If this is outside the the believing community, in other words, what He considers His family, Israelites, and then. You know, now, of course, the, the, the church, you know, the, the circumcision neutral thing we call the church. Prior to, to that time, prior to there being a gospel to, to, to give to people, could people be rightly related to Yahweh? Well, sure they could, because we see that in the Old Testament. Uh, we see it with Nahum and the leper. Um, you know, Jesus holds him up as an example of faith. Now, if you're, if you're for those of you who have listened to the podcast, we had Gerald McDermott on, a, I don't know, a few months ago. And we specifically talked about what the church fathers, you know, sort of did, how they debated and talked about what we call the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. And Jerry seemed to to think that that the faith of a of a pagan like that, a Gentile, was somehow not salvific. I don't know if, if listeners caught that, but I and 
I might have read him wrong or listened, you know, heard something there that he wouldn't have intended, but I got that impression. I don't take that view. I think when, when Jesus recommended Naaman as an example of faith, if he's good enough for Jesus, he's good enough for me. In other words, he responds correctly. He responds well to the information he had. And he had one thing. I know now that Yahweh is the God of gods, period. That just settles the question. He, his faith is in the God of Israel. He's never going to learn the Torah. He's never going to learn the Jewish festivals. He's going to go back to Syria. He'll never do anything in the temple. He'll never eat a Passover meal. He'll never do any of that. But he knows who the God of gods is. And in a in sort of this Deuteronomy 32 context, and I would say just generally, in the Old Testament, that is what salvation is about. How does an Israelite, how are they saved You know, prior to the cross? And frankly, prior to progressive revelation about the plan of salvation. Well, they're, they're saved if they, if they believe that Yahweh is the God of all gods. Is Yahweh who he says he is? Okay, and if he is, we, we believe that this God, the God of gods, entered into a covenant relationship with us. We worship only him. That's what we do. We do what, we, what he tells us to do. We believe what he tells us to believe about himself, and we do what he tells us to do, and we don't worship another god. It's that simple, and Naaman falls within that. So I, I'm of the view that God can treat, this is going to sound a little goofy, but and you know, I'll, I'll try not to chuckle with it, but I'm of the agreement or of the view that, that God still treats unbelieving people today like he treated unbelieving Gentiles in the Old Testament. In other words, they're, they're still not in the family of God. They're still, they're still outsiders as opposed to insiders. And so it's up to God to give them information about who he is, about what he wants, uh, whether that includes the gospel or not. If they respond correctly to that the way Naaman did, and there are other examples besides Naaman, if they respond correctly to that, then it's up, for, it's up to God to accept that person or not or give them more information or something like that. In other words, that is above my pay grade. Okay, I am not going to presume that, that I can answer that question for God. If I, if I get to heaven someday and find out some guy in, in, in China is there because he just believed that Yahweh was the God of gods and that's all he knew, if he's there, I'm happy. And I don't think God blundered. Okay, he didn't commit a theological error. So I, that's, that's kind of the way I, I look at these sorts of questions. I, I, don't, I don't feel either capable of thinking for God on such matters, uh, nor do I think that I'm, I'm tasked with deciding that. Anybody else? This is Forrest for Bamarello. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> anyway, uh, so kind of going back he to the first— He whose name shall not be <laughs> mentioned— um, going back to the first uh, question uh, regarding the third of the angels that fell, when John is uh, writing that, it seems like he's kind of uh, chronologically jumping around a bit. Uh, you know, you, he kind of goes from the birth right to the death and ascension pretty quickly. Is it possible that that third that that fall that he's talking about happened at a much earlier time? Because when the shepherds witness the angels uh, at the birth of Christ. There's no hint of any kind of major battle going on, unless that's the after party. You know, I don't know. Um, is is it possible that that happened? Well, I, I I would say on you know if, if we're saying that well with God time doesn't mean anything and all this chronological talk is really meaningless to God. Well, if you're going to look at it that way, well, sure that then it's possible. Um, I, I don't read it that way. I don't. I don't think we have to have the same elements in every passage when a passage is about the same topic. So it doesn't bother me that the you know like the, the passage with the angels doesn't have this element in it, and Revelation twelve doesn't say anything about shepherds either. You know, it, I don't. I don't have to have all of the elements in both passages uh, for them to be about the same thing. We we have. You know, we, we you have these these scenes in Scripture where they try to encapsulate a bunch of ideas in a very short amount of space. We even have this, like in Philippians two, or is it Philippians two, or is it the first? It's First Timothy. It's the passage that one of the passages passages that is considered sort of a creedal statement that you know Christ he was risen from the dead, seen by angels. You know, have this whole list of things that aren't 
precisely in the, in the right chronological order in the sense that, you know, something is omitted that you would expect to be there, but it, it's considered sort of a, an encapsulated form of the gospel. And you have, you have a handful of these in the New Testament. They're not always the same, but they're still talking about essentially the work of Christ. Um, I'm, I'm okay with that. I don't think that they were had, they had to pass notes around like to make sure. Now, when, if you include a creedal statement, make sure it's got these five things in there. I think they're just sort of encapsulating things as it occurs to them to do it. Um, so that's, that's essentially what I, how I look at John, you know, what he's doing here. Because he does go, he goes from the birth to then the woman is being pursued. Now, if you look at the woman as Israel, and that is the way I, I take it, and lots of scholars do. It's not a specific reference to Mary, but it's Israel. Israel is the woman, God's bride who gives birth to the Messiah. Then it re- it would refer to the the persecution of that community, either the Jews or the believing community that, that ensued, that was connected with the Messiah. You know, with under the under Roman persecution or something like that. So, I, I I'm just not troubled by not having the kind of full description in all of the passages um, that, that we might want, because I, I can still, I still kind of know, you know, what the topic's about. And I know how the elements are relevant to the topic. I just, I don't look for something exhaustive. So I, I don't know that you'd ever really find it. If, if you, again, it, if you take, if you take what's mm-hmm. being said out of a first century context, either abstractly, like this is something that, was in the mind of God, and then angels knew that it was going to be in the mind of God. It was in God's plan at some point to to birth, you know, the, the King, the Messiah, and then the forces of darkness wanted to oppose that. In other words, if you take it out of the first century and abstract it like that, well, then by definition, the, the time doesn't matter. So you could you could say things like that if you did that. Follow up question, sure, Dr. Rob from Hobbs. Uh, in choosing a Bible uh, version. Is there is there a version that you recommend? I always recommend the best Bible to use is the one you'll actually read. Um, <laughs> okay, I I didn't say that, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, <laughs> no. I I would I always recommend that people have one one kind of translation that sort of reflects the the two major approaches to translation. There's there's two schools of thought when you have translation projects. One is referred to as formal equivalence. That is, the, 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 the translation team feels that it, its task is to look at the original text and then in the target language, account for each word as much as possible from the original language to the target language. In other words, we, we, we sort of refer to this as literalism. But it's really about word for word correspondence. Now, no translation does that perfectly, like John chapter two, even the King James, which is very literal, very much formal equivalent word for word correspondence. It'll say, you know, Jesus said to his mother, you know, woman, what have I to do with thee? Okay, well, it, literally in Greek, it's what to you to me. That's literally what's there. Those are the only words that are there. So even something that tries to do word for word correspondence can't get away from having you try to explain that a little bit. The other school of thought is what it, what is called dynamic equivalence and there the goal is not word for word correspondence it's thought for thought. So we look at the original language okay what what is the thought that they're trying to convey and then when we put it into the target language we can use whatever words we want to capture the same thought. Um, so I, I recommend, and, and all English Bibles will tell you in the preface what approach they took. So my advice is always use one of each, uh, just so that you can kind of get a get a feel for how each sort of approach would account for what what they're seeing in the text. And you're always wiser to use more than one translation because if there ever really is a significant. Um, translation sort of problem where there, there's a real elasticity to what something could mean, or if there's a manuscript difference, chances are, if you look, and this is, this is what's great about software, you can do this in a couple seconds. You could look at four or five translations, and if they all differ at some point, 
or, you know, like a specific word, then you know there's an issue there. And that's where you, you should drill down and get another tool to study that. But just generally, apart from that, try to get one that's word for word correspondence, one that's, you know, thought for thought and use them both. I, I should add, I, I prefer in the first category, the it's mostly trying to strike formal equivalence. I, I prefer the ESV, but really only for one significant reason, and that is it is more textually up to date in places than other translations are. The, the big one is Deuteronomy 32. There are several places there where the ESV decided, the committee decided to use Dead Sea Scroll material in the running text, not just put it in a footnote. Okay, I, I think we ought to be doing more of that. Um, and ESV decided to do that at certain points. So I, I give them a thumbs up for that. So I kind of, I like that. So I I just got into it for that reason. And it's it's sort of grown on me. But, you know, I, I'd use other ones too. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Michael from Lubbock. And uh, my question relates to your uh I guess you call this an astral prophecy back in for the, and that may be, maybe I'm reading into your designation of this in Matthew for the birth of Jesus, September 11. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. How is that more related to this idea of the signs in the skies than for instance, that maybe Matthew is just using Isaiah seven in Mm -hmm. which we, this is much longer tradition Uh, historically in the history of the Christian church that we've thought more likely this is, you know, uh, the sign of Emmanuel more so than it is some sort of a astrological mm-hmm. signage. Does that make sense? Yeah, I I I would say it, it's the answer is a both and not an either or. I, I don't I don't think that we we have to pick. John, you know, focuses on this this or that aspect of the birth. You know, we have a we have the birth of a divine king. He wants to try to communicate the idea again. I think in concert with Paul that people could have known a divine king was born. They're not going to get the gospel out of that, but they know that we had a significant event here. It's also not a fulfillment of prophecy. It's, it's a looking back. It's a hindsight kind of thing. So that doesn't exclude Matthew's description of what's going on there as, you know, drawing on Isaiah chapter seven. I I think he does see an analogy uh, pretty clearly with Isaiah seven, also Hosea 11, you know, out of Egypt, I have called my son. Um, it's, it's not to exclude the old Testament. I think different writers introduce different ways of looking at the event, uh, for their audience. So I, I would be an inclusive guy when it comes to that. Not it's this, not that sort of approach. This is Cletus from Amarillo again. (laughs) Um, I got a question regarding, uh, Jude one, Uh, and I know you've, I know you've probably answered this but when uh, Jude is talking about, he's talking about the angels that have been chained in gloomy darkness, et cetera, et cetera. And then he makes the analogy to Sodom and Gomorrah and their immorality. Is there some kind of connection between Sodom and Gomorrah and angelic uh, sexual intercourse? I mean, is that is that why the men of Sodom and Gomorrah were trying to beat on uh Lot's door to to have their way with those men because yeah. they recognize them as being angelic. Right. Are you, so what what you're really asking is are, are comments like going after strange flesh is that really not about homosexuality? Is it really a reference to this Genesis six kind of stuff? Is that what you're? Well, that seems to be what the what Jude's alluding mm-hmm. to there. I mean, I th- I think you, yeah. I, the short answer is yeah. You you can read it that way. And this paper that that Nathan brought up in his question, that was one of the trajectories of that paper, which is why I was interested in it. Uh, the, the the guy was was basically making the argument that this is sort of a literary motif that you see the the Genesis six kind of thing sort of echo in other passages including the, the Genesis 19 episode here in Judah. And also what, what, what he was interested in tracking on was, is this what's behind Romans 1 in Paul? In other words, what this guy was trying to do in the paper was, was argue that this is a literary pattern, and a, a conceptual pattern, uh, where these things are associated together. And then once establishing that idea, going back to Romans 1, 
and then arguing that that's really what Paul is is discussing there and not necessarily homosexuality in that particular passage. So as Nathan you know, suggested, I, I, I'm aware that, that people do that and read it that way in, in Jude and uh, those associated passages. I am still, again, because I haven't looked at, at the guy's textual work, uh, I'm still a little skeptical. To me, the verdict is out there. Can you take that to Romans 1? Um, but what, if it just relates to Sodom and Gomorrah, it, that idea, that approach does have a pretty solid you know, history and scholarship. You can read it that way, uh, which s- some people w- would say, well, that Mike, that, that helps you make the point about the Genesis 6 stuff and whatnot. And I, I guess it would uh, on that point, but I, I don't know that, you know, I, it's it's a little hard for me. Again, I, I try not to, to do too much thinking for biblical characters and writers because while I could probably come up with a good case at the end of the day, I don't really know. In other words, the men of Sodom, can I really get inside their head and say, okay, they knew these guys were angels and that's why they want them. I don't know if I can really say that from Genesis. You, know, you go back and read the story. Um, how would they know that they're they're angels? And I realize that's a little different than the way the writer is crafting things, because maybe the writer does want us to think of Genesis 6. To me, that, that that's possible. But I think a, there's a better case to be made if you could, if there was actually something in the narrative uh, about their reaction to the two men that would sort of take you that direction as well. Well, it seems like they, they must have been somehow markedly different, because even Lot recognized them as being different as they're coming in the gate. And then clearly, rumor had swirled around the town why, that these why do different you think, kind of guys. Why do you think Lot recognized them as different? Well, either because God wanted them to, or visually they were different. Right, and see, both of those thoughts could be could be thoughts coherently thunk about. <laughs> okay, I just don't know where you're going to get yeah, them I from understand. the text. Well, I in guess other words, here, in other words, here, somebody could turn that around and say, well. It was news to have visitors in town. <laughs> hey, we got some visitors in town. They're kind of good looking too. You know, Maybe it was a local gazette. You know, well, see, see, we don't since we don't know the circumstances of that event, and and since again, I I could argue that the view you're articulating pretty well. I could argue some other view pretty well too. But at the end of the day, I don't really know which one is correct because I, I wasn't there, and there's really nothing that I can see in the text that really turns one against, you know, makes one more likely than the other. So to me, it's kind of a stalemate. Now, if, if this guy who was doing the paper, if he comes, if he comes up with all sorts of second temple material, let's just say, and other external material, well, this is really a distinct pattern. Like this just shows up in other places a lot. Well, see, to me that, that could tip me because I, I view the biblical writers in, in these, as solidly in the in these streams of tradition. In other words, they're not just lone wolves writing stuff because they're bored. Okay, they're they're doing they're writing something intelligently as part of a of a at least a reasonably learned, you know, part of their culture that they can produce, you know, books, you know. So I, I view them as literate. I view them as knowing what they're doing intentionally. And so if I if I see evidence for again the, a motif like that 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 they should have known. If they're if they're literate people, they would have run across this because it's in popular text or something like that. That's going to influence the way I look at it. But I don't have that in the can right now, so I'm I'm still kind of stuck where I'm at. So does this also is this is this a potential uh, point for a post diluvian like angelic incursion? Like kind of we have the what you said the four op kalu one being two thirds human so I assume the other three were full deity yeah, the the other the other three we don't have textual remains for them but in if, the Mesopotamian stuff but if this if if this holds weight like we're talking about like this was uh, some because I think a lot of people think because of what happened to uh, the angels being sent to Tartarus that was kind of a um, an incentive for other angels not to do this later, but it sounds like it's possible. I mean, we're not well, directly I, told, but it seems like they're kind of potentially. I, I was that. Gandalf earlier, so now I'll be an angel <laughs> again. If, if I were, if I were an intelligent being and I looked at what happened here, yeah, I would probably think that was a bad idea. 
probably not a good idea to make God man. I'd rather live here than over there, you know. Mm -hmm. But but at the end of the day, you know, you have statements in Job about God not trusting his holy ones. I mean, he says that two or three times. So does that mean that he doesn't is that is that statement that he puts no trust in his holy ones or you know whatever the, the exact wording is there? Does that mean something sort of neutral like well God kind of knows what he's getting. He knows they're not not infallible and he sort of knows what he's what he's dealing with here. He's not going to expect perfection. Is that really what it means or is it a little darker than that? That we we should read a statement like that and think okay, God knows that they're not infallible, but given that maybe God also Don't would right you know like like maybe we're supposed to take that statement about God and the way he looks at them and maybe we are supposed to conclude that they might just be you know willful enough to rebel in the future see i don't personally see anything in scripture that tells me divine beings can no longer rebel well and that, that's, that's an assumption you said that they when he gave them to the nations, he basically showed up to them later and mm -hmm. said, you've done a horrible job. Yeah. So I assume that he would give people the nations that he trusted, like, hey, you're my top right. guys. Right. You're going to run this place. They're, they're, either, they're either inept or corrupt or both. Or, you know, you know, so you, you, that's another good, good example where I just don't see any – the way we're taught in, in Christian circles about angelology is we have the fall and then everything's just decided. Nobody can, like, move. There can't be any more rebellions. You know, everything's just sort of set in stone now. I, those are all assumptions. And I, I think you do have a good contrary example there with Psalm 82. I don't know if if Genesis 19 is one of those because I'm not, you know, the angels aren't the ones who, who are rebelling, you know, in, in that passage anyway. So it's a little bit different. But, you know, you, you get these sorts of episodes. And I, I'm very willing to think that God knows that since they are not me, they could mess up. They could rebel. They could make a mistake. I mean, if, if we can't say that about them, then why aren't we calling them God with a capital G? You know, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. But but again, that's the way we're sort of reflexively taught angelology and demonology in, 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 in a Christian context. And I think it, those are weak points because they're, they're guesses at the end of the day. That's what they are. Clint from Malakoff again. Um, I attend a Bible church and um, very literal interpretation of the scriptures. And, and just until a month ago, I was right there with them on, on everything. And then your book just kind of <laughs> <Great. laughs> ruined yeah, everything I, I for me. I so. again. <laughs> well, so Trey, my can, question, Trey can edit that out. So, <laughs> so um, my question is, um, <laughs> thanks, Rob. <laughs> this is so radical. And we're, we're starting a study of September 10th on First Peter. So right, right out of the gate, we're going to run into, into stuff that ties into Enoch. Mm -hmm. Then you got verse 12 that mentions that the angels who, want to look in some things. Who is we? Is This is your church? Our church. Thing? We have okay. a Sunday morning Bible study. All right. And it's just all the adults together. Um, so we're going to be in First Peter, and you got Enoch that needs to be brought into the context. And you got in verse 12, good, I already good, see. Good luck with that. <laughs> in verse 12, you see where it's talking about uh, even the angels long to look into these things. I could camp there for two or three Sundays in a row, just unpacking mm -hmm. that. Yeah. But just even bringing Enoch up might be like an uproar for these people. And sure. I love them. They're my family. Right. How can I, as a, you know, just attending that class, how can I bring things up in a, a thoughtful way so as to not cause someone to stumble or mm -hmm. to look at me as a heretic. Right. You know, you, you should, you should not feel guilty over not telling people all of the things you know, or would like them to think about. So that, that's the first sort of bridge to cross. You know, you're, in, in other words, you dumping exhaustive knowledge on them, it, them is not a moral issue. Um, if you understand their context, it's a good bet that God does too. And so I, I think you, you do need to be, you know, cautious. You need to be loving. Um, there, there will be times that, that you would be wiser to just not say anything. You know, other times, you know, that you're going to have to know your people, whether you can interject this or that. 
I, I think what, what would be a moral issue is if you sort of pretend that there's nothing to see here, citizen, you know, move along and, and you just sort of do things that way. But, you know, ultimately you just have to, you have to know your audience. I have found that if you can introduce people to, to new things like this in a problem solving way, in other words, I'm going to, we're going to talk about something now and it helps solve this you know, problem of interpretation or what maybe, you know, unbelievers would think is a contradiction. In other words, it, it helps them come away from the discussion feeling good about scripture, feeling affirmed in, in some particular point. Uh, you, you've helped them to defend something they do believe and they know well using this point of information. It, it, if you do that a few times, you know, it, it builds trust. It's constructive, you know, for them. So I would say if you can, you know, do that kind of thing with the content, solve a problem for them, build build up their faith, you're wise to do that. This is why I don't go into churches like on Sunday mornings, because, because I've had people, oh, can you come to Sunday and do this? It's like, no, 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 no. Because all that's going to do is just, you know, create a, a problem for you because I'm just going to leave and then you're stuck with the problem. You know, we're, we're not going to do that. So I'll do things like two powers stuff, you know, like the Godhead in the Old Testament, because that affirms, you know, a, a Trinitarian belief system for them from their Old Testament. And people love that. You know, it, it it's it's scholarship given, you know, to the person in the pew, but it's very constructive. I'll do something on what an imager is, the whole concept of imaging God. The image of God isn't something plopped into us. It's a status we have. And I may throw in a little Hebrew grammar there, you know, just because it has a basis. So I'm not just making it up. It actually has a basis. Nobody's going to remember that, but it's good for them to hear it because they, they know that, you know, okay, Mike's, you know, it's Dr. Mike and he does Hebrew and you know, he read this somewhere that somebody else said this who knows Hebrew too. And that's good enough. You know, it, it's a constructive sort of thing to do rather than just go in there and create the impression that I'm going to be novel today and you have to listen to me because I have a PhD. That, that just, there's just no point to that. So I would, my advice would be try to, try to anticipate, you know, some questions that, that people would have normally about the passage. And then if you can introduce elements of, of this quote unquote new stuff to them that helps address those questions, that would be really helpful, but you're still going to have to pick your spots. You know, first Peter's pretty thorny uh, in this regard, but I wouldn't just go in there and, and dump a whole lot of stuff on them because they're, there are people who will be patient. I mean, I've found just with, with books and stuff, there are people who will be patient and will read the, the book and, and they'll, they'll come out okay. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of other people who won't have any patience at all for it. And, and just, you could have a month with them and, and, and they're not going to listen to it at all. So you're never going to be able to perfectly navigate that, but you, you just want to try up front to be you know constructive about it and not, you know, pick fights, do what you can to get them interested in scripture. That That's a big hurdle. Uh, once you give them reasons to be interested, they'll come back to you and want more. And then, you know, you, you, again, you, you build up a little trust there. And so then you can, you can progressively unfold things, but don't, don't just go in there and dump on them. Um, it, it, it'll just be counterproductive. Kenneth from Fort Polk. Now, what are some good resources for understanding logic and coherence to better interpret the Bible? Oh, boy. A good dose of listening to graduate student papers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that's really a good question. I, I just, I don't know that I have a good answer for that. I, I don't I don't know that you can, and I, I know you can to some degree. I was going to say, I don't, I don't know that you can teach clear thinking. I mean, you, you can... If it were me, if I were forced to give an answer to this, I would say go get a homeschool, like middle school, high school curriculum book on logic or something of uh, at that level on, on logical fallacies and then try to teach people the categories and then illustrate all those things, not just from the, the book examples that the, the textbook would give you, but even, even in things like, you know, Bible interpretation. And, and I would say there's enough of them out there that you don't have to name people or, or preachers or whatever. You, you just use the, you know, the problem that, that, that you have come across 
and and help them you know think through a you know a passage but you can actually go a long time they're just the difference between correlation and causation these two things are like each other so one must have caused the other really i mean it's a it's a a logical blunder and a fallacy that happens all the time not just in sort of novice bible studies but i i can show you that kind of stuff in you know like i said in a graduate student paper or you know even a journal article i mean it, i i said in i actually said this one time in in a graduate seminar a doctoral seminar i thought that i said out loud it must have been a, a moment of weakness or stupidity uh, that I thought we would all be better off as graduate students if we were forced to take a course on logic. You know, and it's like, <laughs> I didn't win hearts and minds that day. <laughs> but I was serious about it because you just run into this. So I, I think that would be a good start, but I don't know that there's any, there's nothing you can just read or study and it just flips the switch on. You you more or less have to to know what the categories are and then see a good dose you know, of, of poor thinking and have somebody really guide you through that so that people, people have their senses exercised to seeing that sort of stuff. Or if you can, if you can take what the textbook offers you and then reduce it to like, here's a set of questions you should ask about every interpretation, you know, and, and again, it's the logical fallacy stuff it's just to, to try to weed it out like that. One uh, slightly different question. Uh, you've written the facade and the portent. Um, what are you trying to accomplish with stories, and why are stories so important? I like to try to piggyback theology on fiction. Uh, in in the case of the facade and the portent, it's it's science fiction. You could also call it paranormal fiction. Um, I do that because there's there's a general utility about it. You can sort of illustrate certain things if it's put in a scene or an episode in a book, just broadly speaking. But it, it, there's another purpose in it, and that is people who are really outside the church, and I don't mean only those who are estranged from it. I mean people who have no context or no interest for, for Bible stuff, Christian stuff. Uh, you can often get them to the table to at least have a conversation if you do it through something like a novel or fiction. Um you know, it, it, it's it's why I do New Age interview shows. It's why I was on the the guy who's the the pagan who lives in PA. I've been on his show twice. The, those people will just never darken the door of a church or anything remotely Christian. But if you get invited to do that, it just presents an opportunity. So I view fiction as just another opportunity to get people who otherwise would not get any exposure at all. Uh, why why do I do ancient astronaut stuff? you know, online, why, you know, that, that kind of thing. Uh, it, it's for the same reason. I don't like the Bible abused or any primary text abused in such discussions. Uh, it, there are lots of caricatures about the Bible in these shows and on these websites. And there ought to be at least somebody out there saying, well, you might want to think a little bit differently about not only this topic, but the way the Bible is used for this topic. So I'll do coast to coast. I'll do, you know, these kind of shows. That's really why I do it. You don't, there's really no other reason to do it. Um, you do, people, a lot of people think, oh, you, you go on a show like coast to coast and you sell lots of books. I don't. I've been on the show over 30 times. I've probably sold a couple hundred books and all those appearances um, because most of the audience is going to be hostile. And I know that going in. So I, I do it so that they get to hear a Christian voice that not only isn't sort of the lunatic caricature that they have of Christians, but also to to disabuse them of the notion that they're thinking well about the Bible. If if I can do those two things, it was a good visit. It was a good show. You know, I, ultimately, I don't know. You know, unless I get an email from somebody afterwards, I I, I don't know. So maybe I sh maybe I could do better things with my time. I, I just don't know. I do them because I'm asked. This is Nathan again, uh, returning to the Romans 1 and uh, what Chandler from Amarillo was talking about. Um, <laughs> he changed his name again. <laughs> <laughs> you become a meme. <laughs> uh, um, and I, I recognize that we are purely speculating on a paper that no one has ever read. Um, but uh, you were talking about the, the strange flesh. 
Mm -hmm. And he asked a question about Sodom and Gomorrah. And I'm wondering if maybe there isn't some Hebrew poetry going on where it might be a both and kind of thing. One on the surface and something below the surface simultaneously going on. And what I'm thinking of is along the lines of uh, 1st Enoch 9.9, Nicholsburg says that they taught hate-producing charms. And those Mm hate-producing charms, the word there is sexually extremely lewd Mm -hmm. in its its nature. Um, And... uh, Anyway, you you compare that to the pottery that we have of uh, keep this uh, uh, clean for anyone who's listening around family. But you have it. (laughs) You 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 have an extremely excited pan chasing after a soldier. Mm -hmm. You have uh, you have Zeus sodomizing uh, a a gentleman uh, who's holding a phallic object in his Mm -hmm. hand. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm just wondering if, if, if the two might, if it might be a both and thing rather than one or the other. I, I think, I think pardon the pun here, cause it'd be a really bad pun. I think the, the conceptual connection is that since, since homosexual behavior in general was viewed as contrary to creation order, therefore it would also be associated with the forces of chaos, which are ultimately, you're going back to episodes like this. You know, the transgression of heaven and earth, that, that's a chaotic thing. It, it, it messes with God's order. Mm-hmm. So this is the same kind of thinking. So I, I think on, on that level, sure, you know, they're, 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 they're kind of going to put those things at the end of the day in the same bucket. Uh, but the bucket might have lots of compartments. I, I, I just don't know if, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm interested in, in there being, uh, again, a discernible pattern. I like patterns. Uh, in in ancient texts, so again, if if he ever produces the paper, and we're we're actually going to hunt him down in November, uh, Burnett and I, because he's <laughs> he's Burnett's friend, so <laughs> we'll corner him at some point. But I I will try to extract either the paper or maybe an interview uh, out of him to try to see what he's actually using for the idea. I mean, I'm familiar enough with the idea. Right. I just want to know. What material are you using? What are what are you working with? What are you tracking on? I, I I just want the raw ingredients. I want I want the primary text source references. So if I can get those, then I can, you know, I can run the rabbit trail myself. Um, I may not do as as good of a job as as this guy has because he's, his head's been in it for a while. Right. He's doing it for something. I don't know if it's di- if it's his dissertation or not. But I would just need again, to, to sort of retrace those steps to say any more, but on just a theological sort of worldview level, yeah, you know, it's all going to be contrary to divine order, which is chaos. Things aren't running the way God wants them to run. Yes, sir. And then my last question of the evening, bearing in mind, I've read both your most recent articles on angelic redemption after the most recent Fern and Audrey episode, uh, so no need to recreate the wheel there, um, and how the angels of the churches are more human than they are angelic in how they're described in the in the letters to the seven churches. Is there a specific verse or verses or ideas that you're tracking on that overtly forbid the notion of angelic redemption, where if you screw I, up, you're done? Yeah, to, to, to me, the big trajectory is the link between the atonement and the incarnation. And since we, we've landed in the book of Hebrews now mm-hmm. um, on the podcast— We'll be getting into that really early, actually, uh, in the in the opening chapters of Hebrews. But if if it was necessary for you know in God's plan for the second person of the Godhead to become a man to effect redemption, that tells me that humans are the target of redemption. So I I think that link is is what suggests to me that that it provides a logic for why there's no clear statement positively about angelic redemption. You get negatives for sure, but you don't get positives and people will say, well, the positive might still be out there. You know, we can't take these other statements as being sort of dual purpose statements. Well, okay. But again, this link creates a logic for why that situation is what it is. And that, that to me is, is the foundation, you know, to the argument of, you know, because there is no atonement for them. They must remain holy. Essentially, well, they, they would they would remain in a, they would not be um, forgiven. Those those that are in rebellion, you know, would have not 
would not get the opportunity to change that that circumstance. They don't get a chance to have their their sins, you know, forgiven and covered, or whatever language you want to use. So, again, for for me, the big trajectory there is the link between the saving work of Christ and the incarnation, becoming a man, as opposed to becoming something else. Uh, so that that for me is is kind of an orienting point, and we'll we'll say more about it as we get into Hebrews in the podcast. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, we appreciate it again. We want to give thanks to Nathan for organizing it and Wayland Baptist University again for hosting it. Thank you all very much. Yep. And uh, thank you all for coming out. And thank Mike for answering our questions as always. And, <laughs> and we appreciate it. A full day of uh, listening to Mike. Uh, I'm sure everybody will agree with me. We could listen all day. So um, we appreciate it. Uh, his efforts. And uh, with that, I just want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. What? That's how the sausage is made. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com. 